Good afternoon. My name is uh, Ed Kirby. I work for the Walton Family Foundation, and uh, this is the first time in my career. Uh, Matt Ladner, who's in the back seat, Dr. Ladner, who works for the uh, foundation. Uh, first time in my career, I've witnessed him actually concede his airtime at the microphone, so he will not be introducing us as scheduled. Um, let me just quickly introduce our panelists, uh, Anise Correa from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cassandra Hart from the University of California at Davis, uh, and Paul Peterson from right here across the river at Harvard University. I'm gonna ask each of the three, uh, starting with Paul, to spend five to 10 minutes talking with us about uh, a quick look and overview, a summary of their recent work studying various forms of educational choice. I just have a quick couple of intro comments before we go to Paul. And I want to set things, while we're going to be looking at empirical evidence here, I want to put things in a political context uh, because the relationship between politics and the evidence you're going to hear this afternoon is, is a very big one. Uh, so right here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the past 20 years, there's been a very powerful crew of elected officials special interest groups who have worked carefully, quite methodically, and unfortunately quite successfully to stall, stunt, undermine the charter school movement here. Not far south in the District of Columbia, members of Congress, current administration, special interest groups motivated yet again have worked deliberately, methodically to stall, stunt, and undermine the DC voucher program fundamentally working to decrease rather than increase the number of single moms in DC making $18,000 a year from getting the opportunity to take a DC federal voucher to take their kid out of a failing school and choose into an effective private school. Further south, two months ago in the state of Louisiana, the US Department of Justice sought to stunt, stall, and undermine the Louisiana voucher program on the grounds that it was causing racial segregation in the schools from which voucher kids were exiting. By the way, it turns out they were wrong. The, DC, the Louisiana voucher program is actually having an integrative effect on the schools from which kids are exiting, not a segregative effect. And so it goes for every significant charter school and parental choice policy in America. I could go on and on for the afternoon with example after example after example. So what is with all of the political opposition? I can only assume a couple of answers, possible answers. Answer number one, educational choice in America doesn't work. It's bad for America. And it's bad for American families, so let's kill it. Or option number two, edu educational choice is working and therefore is threatening those adults who stand to lose something by its proliferation. I only need to linger for a couple of moments on answer number one to realize that that's not the case. Educational choice is wildly popular and successful in America and has been for 200 years for those who can afford it. The political opponents of educational choice are only fighting about whether poor people ought to get it too. So let's go to the evidence and I wanna hit our three panelists with the question is it working, and how is it working? Paul, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna stand up because I get more energy that way. And uh, I do appreciate Ed's uh, design of the program. It's consistent with the old saying, age before beauty. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you bear with me, you'll have some nice things happening. Now all of us, investigators here have a responsibility to tell the truth. So what we do is we do our studies and we do them the best we can and then we're obligated to tell you what we found, whether it's good news or bad news. So 
That's not always the case with interest groups out there, right? You know that there are some people out there who tell you what they want you to hear and not necessarily what the truth is. But, and I'm not saying we know the truth because all studies have flaws in them. But we do have a commitment to telling you what in fact, what in fact we found using the research that we did. Now, the study that I did with Matt Chingos, uh, who was a student of mine at Harvard, but he really was the person who came up with the idea of how to do this, so he deserves the credit for it, uh, is the first study that's ever looked at the impact of a voucher program on elementary school kids much later in life. And you've got to be about as old as I am in order to do this kind of study because, as you know, for somebody in kindergarten to get to college is going to take a while, right? It's going to take about 20 years, something close to that. And so uh, there aren't any, many studies out there. And it, it only so happened that we were able to do this because uh, Matt had this brilliant idea as to how to go about doing it. So these are actually real live students who got vouchers in New York City back in 1997 or 1998. I forgot, you know, we had a three-year program, so I don't know which one of these particular students were in, which year they were in, who graduated from high school and went on to college. Um, so they're, the motivation for the study, right? They're the motivation for the study. Um, now we're doing an experimental study. Experimental studies tell you more precisely what happens than any other kind of study. It's what they do in medicine, pill or placebo. Does the pill work? You test it by comparing it to the placebo, the fake pill. And so when lotteries are held, then it's the luck of the draw as to whether or not you get the voucher or you don't get the voucher. So you're going to compare two groups of people who are similar in all respects except for the fact that one won the lottery. So that's the best way of identifying a true effect. And you're going to have here additional presentations that really try to zero in on getting the truth by using experimental or quasi-experimental data. Now we were lucky enough to come along when Cardinal O'Connor offered to Rudy Crew, the chancellor of the New York City school system back in the 1990s, to send him, the Catholic schools, the most troubled public school students. Every principal and administrator in the Catholic school system in New York City shuddered when they heard those words. Rudy Crew said no. Rudy Giuliani tried to raise the money to make it happen. Opposition mounted. He couldn't do it. But a group of folks from Wall Street said, OK, what we'll do is create a foundation, and we'll come up with the money for it. And we're going to try to get as many students apply for 1,000 positions in the Catholic schools. It turned out to be a, more than 1,000, because it was given to 1,000 families. And we're going to do something like what uh, was proposed by the Cardinal. So in 1997, the program was established. Vouchers were worth up to $1,400 were given to 1,000 low-income families. And the students could enter um, grades two through five if they were, but they had to be in a public school if they entered those grades. If they were going into first grade, they could be any, any student. And over 20,000 students applied, or families applied. And the vouchers were given to only some by means of a lottery. So we were able to compare the winners of the lottery with a sample of those 20,000 who didn't. And our original findings showed sizable benefits for African-American students on the test scores, but not for Hispanic students. So fast forward 20 years later, about, and we are able to look at what happens when they go to college. And what's really neat about the study is we were able to track every one of these, or 99% of them, 
So there's almost no attrition from our study. The original study had plenty of attrition to it, and people criticized, rightly so, our study for having attrition. That is to say, we couldn't follow what happened to every student. But because of the National Student Clearinghouse, which is a nationwide organization created by colleges and universities so that when students apply to a university and have to fill out a financial form, they only have to fill out one form, and they send that to the clearinghouse, and just about every student in the country does this because if they don't get a, a Pell Grant, then they want to get a loan, and, or they want to get a scholarship from their local university, or whatever it is, everybody who goes to college just about will apply for financial aid, and they have to fill this out to the National Clearinghouse. And researchers, if they know, if they can persuade the National Clearinghouse that they're legitimate researchers, can obtain uh, this kind of information so long as individuals' privacy is protected. So what do we find? Well, first of all, we find that African Americans were less likely to go to college uh, if they didn't get a voucher. 36% of those who lost the lottery go to college anyhow. For Hispanics, it's 45% from our sample. These percentages are not too much different from other data we have about elementary school children in New York City in the 1990s when these students were in elementary school. So what do we find? We find relatively small effects on Hispanic students, similar to what we had found previously. They're not statistically significant. And we find big effects for African Americans. We find that 24% increase in the probability that you will go to college if you get a voucher, if you're an African American. The increase is precisely from 36% to 45%, which you translate that into the percent increase, it's a 24% increase. Full-time enrollment in college, 31% increase. Going to a selective college more than doubles it. These pictures are all of real people who use their vouchers to increase their educational opportunities. Uh, it's a really exciting opportunity to see what the effect a voucher can have in the long run. It's not just what happens to test scores. It's what happens to people in their real life over their lifetime. So we compared this to other studies. Our study shows 24% increase for the African Americans. Uh, in D.C., the voucher program there, the, they were only able to look at high school graduation rates. E eventually, I hope they can do the college analysis as well. Uh, but their results are very similar to, our, to ours. A 21% increase in the effect of the voucher program on graduate. Another very good experimental study, uh, high quality study funded by Congress. This is the most powerful evidence we have coming out of the D.C. voucher program that the program in D.C. works. Uh, now, it is not much different than the Tennessee class size, another very good study done in Tennessee many years ago where they've been able to see how, whether or not people can go to college, 19% uh, increase only for African Americans, not for white students in Tennessee, no effects for white students, but big effects for African American students. Uh, and we've heard a lot about effective teachers. We heard it again uh, just over the lunch hour, and effective teachers are very important, and if you have an effective teacher as a opposed to uh, average teacher, it will increase the likelihood of your going to college by 4%. If you have it over three years in a row, it might go up. No, I'm sorry, that is three years in a row if you have an effective teacher. Best estimate available is 4%. I'm not saying we don't need to have effective teachers, but I'm saying that the voucher program effects are much, much bigger than the effective teacher effects that we've been able to detect thus far. How about the costs? No cost for vouchers, right? You actually save money because private schools cost less than public schools in our big city school systems. The Catholic schools are less expensive than the public schools are. Class size reduction, the study that did the Tennessee class size study estimated the cost at $12,000 per pupil. So the cost benefit analysis suggests that it's a pretty good deal for the public if you set up a voucher program and it's probably better than some of the alternatives that you hear proposed instead.
Paul, can I just ask you to briefly speculate uh, the voucher amounts, privately financed vouchers in this work, in this experimental study, were comparatively very small, uh, certainly compared to public spend per kid in New York City, and also small compared to some of the healthier voucher rates today in places like Milwaukee or Louisiana. Uh, can you speculate on if, if you were to replicate your assessment of college matriculation uh, over the next years in Wisconsin, in Louisiana, in Indiana, what might you guess as to findings? Well, it, it, it would be total speculation. I think the most important uh, fact is that the student is in a different school environment and not how much is being spent on them. Uh, you have to remember the cost of education was much less back then than it is today. Uh, in New York City, the Catholic schools were only charging about $2,500 tuition on average. And my guess is that that voucher that was offered to them was topped up by the schools themselves in many cases. So they probably actually got more support than we were able to track with, uh, with our study. Uh, so I would just be very happy with these, with these results if you can have a kind of a shift in um, opportunity structure of this order of magnitude. And uh, well, you take, for example, the DC study, which is a much more well-funded study than the one in New York City. Uh, the effects were roughly comparable. So I think it's the most important thing is the change of school. Paul, thanks. We're going to go to Anise now from MIT. She's been working on a team that's been studying the effects of uh, charter school performance in urban charter schools, particularly those in Boston. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to the foundation for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, as I've said, I'm here on beh behalf of the School Effectiveness and Inequality Initiative, SEII. Um, we do research on schools and school reform. Um, so I'm excited to share our most recent findings on the long-term outcomes for students in Boston charter high schools. Um, SEII in the past has produced scientific and rigorous research on topical education policy debates. Um, and first, to situate these debates, I'll share a few quotes. So my first quote comes from former New York Times education correspondent Richard Rothstein. And here he argues that the work of closing the achievement gap extends beyond schools. Um, and it, it may even be implausible to expect schools alone to close the gap. He also says that um, charters enroll students who are more likely to succeed by virtue of unmeasurable characteristics, such as well-motivated parents. Um, or innate intelligence. And then next, Diane Ravitch, who's a noted author and a former policymaker, discussed some of SEII's work on Boston charters. She says that the question of who will educate the neediest students remains unanswered. So these comments raise three important concerns that contextualize our work. First, selection bias in charters versus non-charter comparisons. So selection bias is a problem that research faces when students are not comparable. So for example, if indeed the students who are attending charters are different in measurable and unmeasurable ways, that's a problem, and this complicates policy analysis. Second um, is a concern about access for special needs groups. Are charters well equipped to serve the neediest students? And then last, can charters make a positive impact for the neediest groups? So here, um, is, this is from our most recent study that compares the SAT score effect for special education and non-special education students. Charter students are in green and district is in gray. And just to clarify throughout the presentation, I'll refer to traditional public school students as district students. And as you can see in both groups, the charter students outperform district students. However, you'll notice the impact is much greater for the special education population. So for the non-special ed population, it's about a 100 point increase. And for the special education population, it's about a 150 point increase. So before we continue, I want to show you how we came to the previous results and the ones ahead. An outstanding challenge in comparing district and charter students is the possibility for selection bias that I just mentioned. So what if, for example, there are consistent differences between the two groups, whether they're measurable or unmeasurable? Our studies account for these differences by taking advantage of the random lottery. We look only at students who applied to charters. We then compare those who are randomly offered a seat to those not randomly offered a seat. And since the lottery is random, there can be no selection bias. So we're truly only comparing apples to apples, and making, which, which helps to make this research design the gold standard for social science research. 
So our most recent research looks at the effects of Boston Charter High Schools on college preparation, entry, and choice. Previous work um, has measured the short-term benefits of charters, such as the 10th grade MCAS score, which is the state score or the state test in Massachusetts. Um, now we look at more medium and long-term outcomes, such as advanced placement and SAT taking and scores, um, college scholarships, and college enrollment. So what we found has been striking. Here we plotted the, the distribution of SAT scores comparing the district to the charter populations. The mass of the distribution for the charters, which is marked in green, shifts to the right. And what we see is about a 100 point increase for those who are attending charters, which is statistically significant. Up next we look at college enrollment outcomes. Um, the non-filled bars indicate statistically insignificant results. So one surprising result is that overall enrollment is unchanged. Uh, the gap between district and charter populations is too small to be statistically significant, but what we can say here is that the students who are um, attending charters are much more likely to enroll in four-year institutions, and that appears to be at the expense of two-year institution enrollment. Uh, is this a good thing? Probably, but we won't know until we can analyze the graduation data, and we're, so that will happen down the road for us. And to summarize, um, Overall, in the study, we saw a boost in MCAS-based competency, state college scholarships, which is awarded um, as a result of the MCAS scores, a shift in charter student scores from proficient and advanced categories, or to those categories. Um, we also see AP test taking increases sharply, but there's very modest gains in the scores. And then, like, as I showed you, there's very impressive SAT gains with especially large gains for special education students. And then the evidence on college is what I just talked on. Uh, so part of what makes our research easy to do in Massachusetts is that we've had a lot of state and district cooperation. We worked very closely with the Department of Education at the state level and also Boston Public Schools and it's been a great relationship and it's really afforded us this capacity to put out this wonderful research. Um, that also extends to working with the charter schools. They've been very welcoming. Um, so we're, we're currently doing some more work in Denver and New Orleans, and those results will be out soon. And you can find out more about our research at our website, which is seii.mit.edu. Um, so that's it for me. Anise, can you hit a couple of questions? So your, your presentation focuses on a comparison of performance of charter students versus district. Could you spend a couple of minutes on what's happening within the charter sector? So in that, the charter uh, policy here in Massachusetts is simply a governance model of an autonomous school of choice. What you do with that is really up to you as a school operator. What did you observe in the variation of performance across charter schools in the sector? And does your team have any uh, thoughts about what accounts for that variation in performance? Sure, so not this report that I'm talking on, but one that we just released on charter effectiveness looks at the different schools throughout Massachusetts. So they're not just in Boston, they're both urban and suburban. Um, and what we found is that there are very positive, significant results for schools that are urban and are classified as no excuses. Um, and I guess, I, I, I think that pretty much everyone knows no excuses, but it's ex extended school day, extended school year, more selective teacher hiring and the like. Um, we actually found decreased achievement results for the suburban, non-no excuses schools in Massachusetts. So, so there is a difference. There is a difference in the quality of the charters. Um, and, and I guess it's up to the state and, and the authorizers to decide which ones are performing well and should stay open. Great, and maybe we can uh, come back to that in the, in the open discussion because there's also at play in Massachusetts a policy debate about whether to allow, in terms of new charter starts, only those proven providers, which happen to be in the state, most of the no excuses charter management organizations. Um, that, and <laughs> from my point of view, it's a little distressing to hear that Anise's evidence uh, would, would you know, bolster that policy argument. Uh, the challenge there, however, is of course that all of those networks, those charter management organizations that are now thriving in Boston and in a couple of other places in Massachusetts, started once as 
standalone single charter schools drafted at somebody's kitchen table. So there's a real kind of policy challenge here. Right. Let's go to, to uh, Cassandra. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to be here uh, to come. Is my microphone on? Okay. Uh, to get here, I had to take a red-eye flight last night, so if I lose coherence at some point, I apologize, but I'll, I'll try to keep it together here. Uh, so I'm talking today on uh, the, the Florida's program, Florida's Tax Credit Scholarship Program, and there are two parts of the debate over school choice that I want to address. The first is, you know, there's going to be, a, in any school choice program, a relatively small number of students is a, a share of the total student population that's going to be taking part in those programs. So one of the major things we want to evaluate when we're looking at school choice programs is what happens to the kids who stay behind in the public school system. If, uh, you know, if kids who participate benefit, but it really hurts the kids who are staying behind, that's something we would worry about. Another question you hear about a lot in the school choice uh, debates is whether the people who go into the programs are kind of the, you know, the best and the brightest, that there's cream skimming, if it's just taking kids who would do well in schools anyways, and the designs that, uh, that Anise and Paul used rule that out in terms of the program effects that they're looking at, but that's a, a concern that you hear a lot in the debate, so I'm speaking to both of those parts. In the context of the Florida Tax Credit um, Scholarship Program, the program is uh, pretty well established at this point. It was signed into law in spring 2001, first started accepting students in 2002 and 2003. And this is a means-tested program, so it is, uh, in order to be eligible, students have to be low income. They have to be eligible for free and reduced price lunch, family incomes below 185% of the federal poverty line to, to initially qualify for the program. And initially, uh, they are required to have either been in Florida public schools previously or be in their elementary school year. So the idea behind the way the program is structured is that they, the uh, voucher wasn't intended to just be money for people who would have had their kids in, in private schools anyway. It's supposed to uh, help kids who don't have that option otherwise. Um, currently, the voucher is about $5,000. Initially, it was about $3,500, which doesn't sound like a lot if you're thinking about, you know, Exeter or one of the really expensive schools, but that covers about 90% of um, a religious elementary school tuition in Florida. And it's a very large program now. It's serving over 50,000 students, uh, so quite a, a substantial program. Ideally, what we would want to do in order to evaluate the competitive effects of the program is a nice random assignment like, like Paul and Anise have and be able to say, these schools have competitive pressures applied to them, these schools don't, let's compare them. But of course, this is a statewide program, so that's not gonna work, you can't do that. And so we try to do a quasi-experimental design instead, and this map of Florida is to try to give you an intuition of, of how we went about this. So if I can uh, ruin the audio and step away from the mic, the idea that we have here is that when a voucher program passes, it ought to matter more for people who actually have voucher, uh, private school options nearby. So, you know, these uh, circles are all five mile radiuses around public schools. The idea is that a voucher program should matter somewhat more for a school that has, you know, 12 options nearby than for a school that only has one or no options nearby. So we try to see whether, uh, whether any score improvements are greater for public schools that realistically there's a chance that they're going to be losing some students to, to private schools. So what we find when we look at this, it's, a, it's kind of complicated to tease out what this all means. Uh, what we try to do is compare the effect of having another, an additional private school nearby for schools after the law passes and before the law passes. So if competition matters for schools and if it makes them improve, you would expect an additional school nearby to matter more after the law is passed. So this is all in relation to 1998. The thing to note is after that uh, rather thin, as I'm seeing it up here, uh, vertical bar, you see a big increase in the, uh, in the size of the line. And what that indicates is that having other private options nearby starts to matter more once there's a voucher that can support children in potentially using that option. Now I say big and I wanna walk that back a little bit because in terms of the scale here, uh, these actually aren't huge effects. Um, these are hundreds of a standard deviation. So the point to take away from this graph is actually that there is a small positive effect on public school students' test scores when there's increased competition from a voucher program. It's not a silver bullet. 
It's not uh, making test scores actually go off the roof, but it is, uh, it's certainly not hurting public schools to have this increased competitive pressure, and, and there is a modestly positive uh, effect. So one thing you, you start to think about is, uh, you know, maybe that's the kids who are coming into this program, for instance. And it takes us to the cream skimming bet. What this graph shows is it addresses whether or not the kids who are going into the program are disproportionately the best and the brightest, or whether it's, it's uh, kids who are struggling in their public schools. And this compares the math scores for students who are, have been tested um, in, in public schools previously. So these are kids who are in public schools eligible to go into the voucher program. Uh, and what you can see is this red line is uh, people who are eligible, they're low income students, they're not participating in the program compared to these blue, the blue line which is students who are in public schools and then switch into the program in the next year. Uh, the blue line is, is further towards the low end of the distribution. So this shows you that statewide, the kids who are going into the program are actually lower performing than kids who are also eligible for the program, low income, but are not opting to go into the program. So this suggests that the cream skimming isn't really at work. Now, you know, one thing you might be worried about is if kids are also disproportionately coming from low performing schools, they might be performing worse than other low income kids across the state, but they might be the best and the brightest in their low performing school. So what we were also able to do is look within a given school at the scores of students who are eligible and leave and students who are eligible and don't leave. And what we found is that kids who participate in the program are actually low performing even within their schools, which are disproportionately made up of low performing children. They're overrepresented in kind of the lowest quintile of performance within their school, and they're underrepresented among the top performers. And I've showed you math scores here, but it looks very, very similar if you're looking at the reading scores as well. So what this suggests to us is that uh, the criticisms of school choice programs that maybe this hurts kids who are in the public schools and maybe it's cream skimming and they're taking the best and the brightest, at least in Florida's program, which again is means targeted pretty tightly to, to help low income kids, that doesn't seem to be playing out. It, it seems to be working pretty much as intended in terms of the uh, broader systemic effects in Florida. And, and like Massachusetts, we're very lucky that Florida has a, a, a very great data system and they're um, very willing to undergo program evaluation and, and look at this. So if you have any further questions, I should also say this is work with David Figlio and Molly Metzger. I've got the sites up there, but um, I, yeah, this is joint work that um, this is all a part of. Cassandra, while we've got you, um, <coughs> Uh, so David Figlio is focused more on the participant effects, how are kids doing in the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship Program. You focus more on the competitive systemic effects. Uh, but while we've got you, can you just give us a quick kind of capture of what those participant effects look like that Dr. Figlio has been working on? Sure. So I haven't been on those studies. I've kind of read them secondhand, and, and probably people from Step Up for Students have a more recent uh, sense of, of what the most recent evaluations were. My understanding of those was that it was a, a sort of a similar story and that the kids who were um, going to the program looked pretty similar, they were making fairly similar gains, right, to the um, students who were in traditional public schools. And I think maybe there were mildly positive effects, but, uh, but certainly he didn't find any evidence that they were performing less well than the students who, uh, who didn't go into the program but had expressed an interest in it who were still in. School. So it looks like, um, you know, a, a pretty similar effect overall to the public schools, and and probably modestly helped. Is that is that an accurate? Great. Thank you. Let's go straight to questions. Matt, you have a question to lead off. I do. I have a question for Anise. Um, there have been other studies that have found similar findings with suburban charter schools, and they're, they're starting to add up, quite frankly, including, including your work. And at this point, I've heard some armchair theorizing about why that might be, why we find suburban charter schools don't perform uh, as well as we might hope. And uh, the armchair theorizing, and of course, social science teaches us anything, is that sometimes armchair theorizing is right and sometimes it's wrong, but you never trust it. So I'm curious as to whether your, your research gives us any clues um, the hypothesis I've heard I might call the crunchy parent, suburban parent thesis, right? And the crunchy suburban parent thesis would hold that, that the types of people that are selecting charter schools in the suburbs are different than those in the inner cities, 
and there might be actually selecting charter schools to get away from an emphasis on test scores and whatnot. I, I don't have any emotional attachment to the thesis or not, but I'm curious as to whether your research gives us any clues about whether it might be correct. Uh, I mean, I don't, all I can say is that everyone who is applying to the charter schools is in, included in our sample. So we're following both those who do and do not get offered a seat at the charter schools. And so it helps to explain for what might be these unmeasured differences between the two groups. Um, but as far as how the non-urban would differ from the urban groups, I guess that would be, we, we can't, I can't clearly speak to that, unfortunately. I don't know if anyone else. Yeah, I think Paul wanted to add in. And by the way, if you have questions queuing up, um, please approach the mics. And the reason is because this is being videotaped, so it'll be easier to uh, capture it all. Paul. Well, uh, this is speculation, of course, because we don't have really good data on exactly what's happening in uh, different kinds of charter schools. But uh, you do have to remember that, generally speaking, the quality of the school in the public sector is going to be better the district schools are going to be better in suburban areas than they are going to be in the central city. So that the comparison is going to be with a different set of district schools. Um, and secondly, it may be that if parents are unhappy with the district schools in the suburban setting, they're going to be unhappy for different reasons. And it may be that their child is not fitting into that district school, and that's why they're looking for a charter out in the suburban area. So given the kinds of situations that families are facing, depending on where they are, uh, you could get these kinds of effects that we are observing in quite a number of studies out there, that the big positive impacts are showing up in places like Boston and New York City and other urban areas. And when we start looking out in the hinterland, we don't see those big effects. So we don't know if it's because the comparison is with a stronger set of district schools or whether it's a different set of thinking as to why we want to put our child into a charter school. Great, sir. Hi, my question has to do with uh, private school enrollment in areas with uh, voucher programs. Uh, do you see overall enrollment in private schools rise as a result of this program, or has that been more stabilized? Or put another way, uh, are vouchers doing anything more than just shuffling who gets the opportunity to attend these schools rather than expanding the overall opportunity, overall supply of access to these schools? Uh, so D I'm not sure about DC specifically. Um, Florida is where I've done more of my work, but I can say I've actually um, started looking at this in Florida and preliminary results suggest that there, there were two programs that started sim pretty much simultaneously in Florida. So there was the uh, Florida tax credit program that targeted low income kids and there was also the McKay scholarship program that targeted students with disabilities. So there's these two things that kind of start operating simultaneously. And between the two of them, it does look like there sort of starts to be an increase in private school enrollment in Florida that's not matched in other states that don't have uh, private school voucher programs starting to operate at the same time. So it does look like there is um, an increase in enrollment which suggests that maybe there's some new capacity opening up at schools or maybe they were, they were operating below capacity before and are being filled up but it does seem that there is an actual increase in enrollment rather than just a shuffle. And that's just Florida, so I'm not sure about DC and other programs like that. Great, but, but before we go to the next uh, question, I wanna preload a question for each of the three of you for toward the close of the session, which is, uh, as, you, as you look forward from today, w given the proliferation of various forms of choice, growth in charters, growth in private school uh, voucher programs, uh, growth in virtual learning, ESAs, et cetera. From your perspective, what most needs to be on the research agenda for the next five years studying educational choice in order to keep pace with the decisions that policymakers are going to be facing on the question? Sir, let's go to you. Yeah, 
Hello, uh, Bob Griffin, the Alaska Policy Forum in Alaska. There's a frequent talking point that uh, we've heard against uh, charter schools uh, in our area is that uh, the, the talking point is that, that uh, low performing students are frequently expelled from uh, charter schools. Uh, and, uh, you know, small sample size in, in my hometown of Anchorage, uh, there's only eight charter schools. And uh, uh, a survey of the principals uh, indicate that they were. That, that is not happening in the, those charter schools. And as a matter of fact, the principals were, were pretty offended by the, the, the comment. I just wanted to know, has there been any research done uh, if that is an actual effect somewhere? Because it seems to be a, a very, very frequent talking point from people that are opposed to charter schools. Uh, so our research actually finds, kind of surprisingly, in this report and also in the report that we did on Kip Lynn, which is a city in Massachusetts, that the students with the lowest baseline scores so if we were studying a, um, like a high school, we would look at the eighth grade MCAS scores. The kids with the lowest baseline scores are actually stand to gain the most by attending a charter school. And that's true not just for low baseline, but also for special ed. It's also true for um, if you get free or reduced lunch. Um, so the, I think that's actually one of the most exciting things about our findings is that we find that the kids who are doing the worst before going to charters actually are gaining the most, which is really exciting. So in our, in our study, we follow every student. So if you're assigned or if you are offered a seat at a charter school and you choose to go, even if it's only for one day, and then say you're a bad kid and you drop out, we still treat you as part of the charter group. So we're, we're follow, it kind of take, takes care of that problem, so we're able to follow all those students and still, and still have these great results. Paul, you want to add to this? Yeah, we did a nationwide study using the NAEP data, uh, and it's, th that data is not very good for estimating how good a school is, but it does tell you who's going to that school, and the results nationwide are very consistent with what Anise just said. Uh, charter school population is much more likely to be disadvantaged on a variety of characteristics than is the traditional public school population in that vicinity. So that's a pretty consistent finding across uh, quite a few uh, studies out there. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, this question is for uh, Paul Peterson, but the others may have an input on it as well. It's very interesting when you're looking at you know, the college results and you're looking at such a big difference based on race. I mean, you had a huge difference based on race. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts as that obviously we all want minority students to benefit, but your Hispanic students aren't benefiting, apparently you're, just, you're not minority or not. But I'm wondering as well, with the Boston data, did you break that? You were talking about the difference between kind of urban and suburban, but did you do any more kind of slicing of that as far as demographics to see if what held true for the whole cohort held true if you sliced it by race and ethnicity? And I'm imagining it probably your suburban and your urban may have had different mixes of that as well. That was kind of my question. Well, uh, on, first of all, you have to remember all the students were from low-income families. Right. Um, we had very few white students in our study, so it's very hard to estimate effects for them. It is interesting that the ben you would have thought the effects would have been more positive for Hispanics because most of the schools are Catholic schools, and most of the, um, the Hispanic population tends to be more Catholic than the African-American population is. So you would have thought that there would have been a better fitting in of the Hispanic student. So we've been trying to figure out why we're getting these findings, and we don't have a definite answer. But we tend to think that the Hispanic families might have been selecting that, uh, uh, taking the voucher uh, in order to uh, provide religious instruction to their students, that religious motivations were very strong for them. And it may have been the case that the African-American families were selecting the uh, the private schools uh, because of educational reasons. Uh, it's also possible that the African American students were attending inferior public schools, their public school situation. We, we see evidence in the data set for both of these propositions. So just remember that those Hispanic students were more likely to go to college anyhow. 45% of them were going to college as compared to 36% of the African Americans. So it, it shows, it's their, it seems to be the case that the voucher is the most valuable for those who are the most challenged. So consistent with Paul, our, our findings I just had mentioned on Kip Lynn, 
Um, that, that school was largely Hispanic, and most of the positive results that we found were driven by the Hispanic population and their ELA scores. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that speaks to you. You wanted to hear a little bit on urban, suburban differences? Yeah, well, I was interested. I mean, you, you had done your cohorts. I was wondering if you had sliced it further and compared you know, a cohort that maybe was African American that you know, didn't make it in the lottery and did. To see if there were any substantial differences by race across the slices there. I believe, that, did we do? I believe there were positive effects for Hispanic and black populations in our LTO report. I, yeah. This is Daisy, who's our research assistant on the team. Sir, thank you very much. Um, coming from a background that is uh, that, that I where I rely very much on on data and what those data help us uh, learn about processes, I was very uh, curious when 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 you spoke of your survey uh, of your uh, uh, your your analysis of, of these, um, and I don't know how possible this could be within your study, but. I think we can all generally accept the fact that there are families, and this crosses all uh, socioeconomic um, lines, that are more interested in education, good education. So the, the, the child, the student, the family, they want to get a better education. So perhaps that's a driver to get them to engage in the voucher program. Um, so it's almost as if maybe those who are entering into a voucher system or, or looking to get out of the public school system are predisposed to getting a better education. Now, I don't know how that could be measured, but I was wondering if in your studies there were any um, scales or, or any way for you to adjust for that. And I hope that was clear in, in the way I asked it. Yeah. Um, I Unfortunately not. We're working with, with um, big state administrative data sets, so it would be great if we had some kind of attitudinal measure or, or any interviews with parents to talk about the value that they place on education, but unfortunately we don't have that. Um, I guess what, I, what you might expect, though, is that if that were true, you know, within the same public school, you might expect them to be performing a lot better. So th they, it probably is families that, that put a lot of value on education because at the very least they see their kids struggling and are responding to that, right? So you, you certainly would think that the families who are participating must value education highly, but we also think that there seems to be some element of, and also at least for the kids who are in public school thir through third grade, and so we have test data for them, some element of mismatch. Um, and, and it's possible that at the, at the kindergarten level, you know, a lot of people go straight into to kindergarten for the first time. We, we don't have any test data on them, so it's possible that those kids are the ones who um, who are from families that are especially driven by education. And I just can't measure that. I wish I could. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for the work you've done. Thank you. I, I just want to add one thing to that, uh, and that is that that's the advantage of the experimental design, the use of the lottery, because those who lose the lottery, they. They were equally committed families because they applied for the voucher too. They wanted to win. They lost, unfortunately. So actually, that's the purpose of the design of a experiment is to, to try to take into account the fact that probably those who are seeking out a charter school or voucher school are particularly concerned about their children's welfare. And we want to uh, make sure that when we look at the effects, we've taken that into account. So the lottery. Use, the use of the lottery is the way we address that issue. Now, there is a larger question that you're saying. Now, maybe vouchers and charters are just serving a population of people who are really concerned about their children's education, and there's this larger public out there that isn't applying for these opportunities. Well, one way of thinking about that is, well, so you are serving the population that is eager to have a better opportunity, so is that particularly bad? Unless you can show negative effects on the rest of the population, which is what it makes the Florida study so interesting that you don't see those negative effects. And secondly, 
anytime you have an innovation, there's only going to be a limited number of people who are going to apply initially. It's sort of like who started using the iPhone. It was just, you know, those nerds. But gradually, we all had iPhones. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a process, and we have seen that wherever these programs, Milwaukee, the best example, where you had a voucher program, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger with every passing year. And so we, if, if it is the case that the charter movement and the voucher movement doesn't have a political lid pl put on them, the chances are very great that the number of people uh, who get engaged and want to have their children in an alternative setting is going to steadily increase. Thank you. Excellent points. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. It's a little bit on the line that, that he was talking about. The, I came from a very low income family. My mother was only ninth grade. My stepfather was fourth grade. And, but on the other side, I grew up, became a Marine officer, and all my three daughters went to school in Irvine, California. Universe of pot in quieter school. I grew up in Massachusetts, and years ago, they used to have a blind eighth grade test. And if you got high enough on the test, it didn't matter. I got hot. I got really high on the test. My teacher was totally surprised. But I'm taking Latin, I'm taking algebra and all these. <clears throat> but it wasn't the education effect. I looked at the other 30 kids in the class, and I'm saying, they're no better than me. They all expect to go to college. Until I passed that test, I had no expectation of going to college. I don't, can you measure the benefit of a child going to a school, whether it's a public school or a charter school, where the total expectations of education is different, even if the parent is not involved in the education at all? I would venture to say that that, that works into the no excuses, non no excuses research that we did. So a big element of no excuses schools is this high expectations. Um, and I think that's, it makes a lot of sense that the no excuses schools are best serving the students who possibly might have gone to schools with very low expectations. Thank you. Hi, my question is for Anise. It's with regard to the special ed findings in your study. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit more of how you controlled for different types of special needs and different levels of, of disability or learning um, challenges so that you truly had apples to apples? So like Cassie had just said, unfortunately, all we had to match on was state administrative data. So the only thing we can tell is whether they're classified as special ed or not. It would be wonderful if we were able to, to make those differences and see differences between the types and, and severity of special ed. Okay. Thank you. So uh, our next questioner is not actually a questioner. He's a, he's a plant in the audience. <laughs> um, this is my friend John East from the great state of Florida. And John is one of the lead strategists of the Step Up for Student Tax Credit Scholarship Program in Florida that Cassandra Hart and her partners, like David Figlio, have been studying. And so I wanted to shift back over to policy making a little bit. And John is, uh, lives sort of in the, in, in the between land between the empirical evidence and legislators making decisions about the program that, that he helps to advocate for. So John, can you, f from my perspective, uh, the Figlio Hart Metzger work provides some compelling argument for the state of Florida to expand the program. How do you all look as an advocacy team at that data? How do you use it? And do the policymakers controlling this program care about the empirical evidence, or are they making decisions based on other factors? <laughs> Thank you for the question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and Cassandra would like to add, please say the legislators care. <laughs> um, actually, I think they do. I think I could uh, give uh, Cassie good news. But uh, um, it's, it's been hugely valuable in Florida. Uh, uh, in Florida, like most states who enacted these types of programs, it was enacted in 2001. Uh, in sort of a robust throwdown debate that had uh, uh, m uh, the Republican majority and a grand total of one uh, uh, Democrat voting for it to, uh, to initiate it. Uh, but what we have now is, is research. We have six years' worth of uh, testing data that speaks to, uh, it, it precisely the way Dr. Hart described it. Uh, it shows us a couple of very important things that were part of the original debate. Our, our, uh, is, this, is this scholarship kind of skimming from the free or reduced lunch 
uh, uh, a population with the public schools. No, actually, it's just the opposite. We know that concretely now from six years worth of data. The schools who, ch the students who choose the scholarship, are among the lowest performers in disproportionately low perf uh, public uh, performing public schools. Uh, we also know that the students are among the poorest. The uh, ha uh, average household income uh, last year was only 6% above poverty. Uh, we know that they're disproportionately minority. They're uh, disproportionately one parent household. And we know a couple of, another, a couple of research uh, points that, that the public schools, as Dr. Hart described, uh, most impacted by the scholarship are doing pretty darn well themselves. Uh, so, so in that environment, it becomes a lot easier for people who are in the middle and have angst about programs like this to see, well, and that's just not so bad. This is actually serving the kids. We, they told us it would serve. Uh, and it's not hurting public schools either, traditional public schools. Uh, so in 2010, the last time we had a major expansion bill, uh, almost half the Democrats in the legislature supported it. The uh, majority of the black caucus, almost the entire Hispanic caucus. The, these kind of data points are very important in, in that debate. John, thanks. Cara. Hi, thanks. Um, and I want to go back to the question you asked to the panel prior to opening it up to the floor. Can we really be dictating the types of choices um, that our parents can make by um, you know, having legislators legislate policy that says only a certain type of choice. I want to go back to that, talk about the evidence, and do we lose sight of the new innovations that we could possibly be bringing to the table um, by allowing legislators to, to uh, dictate that kind of policy? I don't know if this is the opportunity for me to say that what legislators should be trying to do is create some level playing fields out there because uh, if, if we could have the charter sector growing and the voucher sector growing and access to digital learning and the funding stream for all of these being roughly comparable, then parents would maximize out the choice. I do worry about uh, charter schools um, attracting students away from private schools. That is happening in some parts of the country. And of course, why not get a free education instead of having to pay for it if the free education is is pretty good, so I, I think that's uh, that's unfortunate. I, I like the way things are evolving in Milwaukee in that regard. Um, it's still a central city with all of the urban problems that uh, central cities, particularly in the Midwest, are facing. But the fact is, is that the charter sector and the voucher sectors are both growing, and they're and it's a lot mainly because they're on roughly equal, it's not exactly the same, but roughly equal playing fields. So I don't know that research can show too much as to why you should do it. It just sort of makes like it common sense. Uh, it does, and I, the only thing that research is showing or experience is showing is that the public gradually shifts in its uh, allegiances from one institution to another. So the fear that there's going to be a dramatic impact on the public school is probably much, much overstated. If, if there's a migration out of your traditional district school, it's, it's going to take uh, many, many years for that to happen because people change schools only very slowly. Anise, I don't know do if that's a response or? to your concern or not. Yeah. yeah, Anise or Cassandra, should policymakers be defining the types of choice or just opening up more choices? Right, so I think being a policymaker seems quite difficult. You have to take in all this evidence, and, and really the work is to decide what's best for kids. Um, I would say that it's not so much dictating to open up these policies as, as it is like it's offering choices for families and for students. And if the results are positive in these schools, I think it is best for kids, and that makes sense. And I, and I'd agree with that and say, you know, I, I, all of us up here are going to be putting in a plug for research. I think you, you know, you open up new options and then you want to make sure that you evaluate them and make sure and, and figure out if they're working and for whom they're working well so that parents <coughs> have that information on whether, uh, you know, different types of educational environments seem to be good in general and for their type of student in particular. So I, you know, plug for more research, which academics always have to do. <laughs> Great, let's go with one last question, sir. Uh, in regards to the random assignment studies, I've been seeing more critiques suggesting that they 
may not be as reliable because the, the schools themselves that are having the random assignment might be already better than the other schools, which is why they have the lottery to begin with. I was wondering, how is that, and that, that critique actually is, seems very valid, uh, but how is that being addressed in your research or in your, your counterpoints to a complaint like that? So that was actually listed as a caveat of our research design, which is, so for in this, this example or this last set of research that we've done on Boston Charter High Schools, we included six of the nine and then the other three that were left out, we, we had to leave out because they were either undersubscribed or had very poor lottery records. Um, so we, that's, that is what it is. We are, we're unable to do anything to account for that. I don't know if, Paul, you can speak to that. Oh, well, the earlier study that your team did uh, actually did something pretty fascinating. They used observational data where they couldn't use experimental data on those schools where they, the lottery wasn't sufficient. And they found um, s similar effects. Uh, it's a very neat study, lots of interesting things. But uh, the point was is that uh, by focusing in on the lottery schools, they did focus on somewhat better schools, but the results really could be generalized somewhat beyond that. Nonetheless, I would say we need to have um, full-scale nationwide studies of all charter schools so that we can, and it won't be able to do these experimental studies. Experimental studies are necessarily limited by the fact that you've got to have a lottery in order to study the school, and they may be exceptional schools, so they should be supplemented with other kinds of research. Uh, and I think we're learning now how we could do non-experimental research that's pretty good. I don't think we've got quite the right study. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to Washington, D.C. We're going to bring together all the charter school, uh, or major charter school investigators and major charter school operators together to see if we can come up with a plan that will try to address this question and also what other issues are going to be on the agenda that uh, we really need more information about. One thing we want to look at is grit. Are, are charter schools better at uh, uh, helping students acquire the capacity to get ahead quite separate and apart from their test score performance? Great, we're gonna uh, close off here. Let me say in closing, uh, 20, 25 years ago, there were very few folks in high standard education reform research. Uh, Paul was really a, a, almost a solo act back then with a handful of PhD candidates in the government department alongside him. Um, and something, you know, a vision Paul has had since then and put a lot of investment in is that uh, next generation of gold standard methodologists who are studying educational choice as well as a full range of other ed reforms. Uh, Cassandra and Anise and their teams obviously represent that and there's a, a, a very vibrant, broader crew of this generation. Uh, so I just want to thank each of you. This is a really powerful contribution to the work of a lot of the folks in this room. We appreciate it.